では午後の最初のセッションになります、えー、ベンジラベンダさんに、えー、アドベンチャーズのリファクチャーリングですよろしくお願いいたしますはい、uh, I'm Ben This is Adventures in Refactoring.、Uh, it's not as exciting as it might sound because it's refactoring. I think it's an adventure, but there'll be no Rolling Stones or Indiana Jones or anything like that.、Uh, I'm Booga on GitHub, Twitter, top level domains, everything that matters. So, not Snapchat. Snapchat doesn't matter.、Uh, I work at GitHub on internal tools like deployment, continuous integration,、uh, the pager, stuff like that.、Uh, Uh, that means I've refactored a lot of quick one off projects that turned really, really important.、Uh, but before I get any further, I wanted to ask、uh, this is Ruby. Most of the talk is in Ruby. Raise your hand、uh, if you can read this much Ruby. Hopefully, each slide will be no harder than this. Okay, good. Most of you. <laughs> All right. Uh, First slide,、uh, what is refactoring? If you're going to talk about refactoring,、uh, you should know what it is.、Uh, I define refactoring as changing code without changing behavior. Anything you can do to a project that doesn't change inputs or outputs is refactoring. If we wanted to be perfectly pedantically correct,、uh, it would be changing code without trying to change behavior、uh, because lots of bad things happen. Uh, I would like to start with、uh, reasons to refactor, but even more. Bad reasons to refactor.、Uh, there's a lot of refactoring that people do. Everybody has done it、uh, if you've written a line of code, whether you knew it or not.、Um, one bad reason to refactor is to increase consistency.、Uh, for example, changing quotation marks to be equal. This is a great thing to do. I love doing it, and we'll talk about it more later. But talking about consistency as a reason to refactor isn't a strong reason. Drying things up, as we say. This is also a bad reason to refactor. It's a great thing to do. Change two lines of code into one. Reduce the possibility of making errors in the future.、Uh, you can improve、uh, the abstractions, the layers you're using.、Uh, you can, for example, with this example,、uh, get first address city implies you have a bunch of address objects. So we change it into a list of addresses.、Uh, I would call those bad reasons. Uh, and the reason for that is that good software projects can measure success. You can measure the success of a refactoring as well, but it's very difficult to measure how consistent something is, how dry something is, or how well abstracted something is.、Uh, these are usually matters of taste.、Uh, and when we set out to do a thing, when we say, I'm going to refactor something today,、uh, it would be nice to have the ability to say, Did it work? Was I successful today?、Uh, So, if we want to talk about measuring refactoring success,、uh, the first thing and the most important thing is to maintain correctness, which is to say, to not change the behavior of the code. That is, after all, the point of refactoring.、Uh, to take a previous example, if I took this little example of、uh, refactoring a user with multiple addresses into a list of address objects,、uh, and I change the order they come back in, I have failed. Uh, a refactoring should not change behavior.、Uh, the next most important way to measure a refactoring success is the almighty diff stat. You should, on a good refactoring, be able to remove code. I don't know why this is true, but it always is. This is not a great refactoring. You've added 181 lines and removed 130. <laughs> this is good. This is adding 31 lines and removing 40. This is 10 fewer lines of code than you started with, which is 10 fewer places to have a mistake. Generally speaking, this is one of your best clues that you've done a good job when you've set out to improve code over time. At GitHub, we care enough about this that, in addition to the big plus one emoji that everybody puts onto a PR, you can put a hocho.、Uh, and everybody knows this is a very positive sign, and everybody's saying, good job for removing all those lines of code. It's something important enough to be worth calling out all on its own. Another way to measure success、uh, is if your test coverage has improved.、Uh, test coverage, unfortunately, is still sort of hard to measure, but you know it when you see it.、Uh, there are test coverage tools,、uh, but I don't trust them very much.、Uh, this code,、uh, which runs fine with FooTrue 
or Bartru, but not Fu and Bartru, has 100% test coverage uh, when run with either, but not both. Uh, coverage can be deceptive. And uh, it's something where when you look at it, you should be able to say, I feel more confident uh, in these tests. Closely related is test expressibility. Uh, this is different than test coverage. Uh, it's something where it's much easier to add a new test. When you're working with old code, you might often add new test coverage without being able to increase the expressibility uh, of the test because you're afraid to change it. So the first thing you're doing is adding tests. Uh, expressibility is a word I made up. Uh, so I like to describe it with an example. Uh, this is one of the deployment projects I refactored. It's a little bit of the code pulled out. Uh, we have something like 11 things that can prevent a deployment from happening. And this is the matrix of tests of just two of them. Uh, I fought this for a really long time and tried a number of different ways uh, to express it, uh, but these tests were nested well off to the right of this slide. Uh, it was a very bad test suite, uh, and it was all my fault. Uh, after I worked with it for quite some time, uh, I ended up on this. And I really hate these class names, right? Uh, so rather than have a deployment to check if master is merged or have a deployment check if continuous integration has passed, there are objects called checklist items. And it's, it's a terrible class name. Checklist item is like thing or entity or object. If you're naming things like this, you've done it wrong. And I feel like checklist item is that. Uh, but I made a bunch of these checklist items for merge and master, and if continuous integration had passed, I added them to the deployment where I just pulled a bunch of checklist items into a list, and I couldn't argue with the results, no matter how much I hated the class name, checklist item, uh, that the test got simpler, the nesting was removed. We, of course, kept a couple of integration tests to make sure uh, that the tests are, uh, that the checklist items are being called correctly, uh, but we're now able to add new behaviors about what can interfere or modify a deployment in process and test just those behaviors. So expressibility is about being able to write tests that express the correct behavior of what you're changing and not the whole system with your change. Another way to measure success is improved performance. A lot of people don't consider performance work to be refactoring. I do. Uh, the reason for that is not necessarily because it's 100% correct, uh, but because the goals of performance work and refactoring are the same. Namely, don't change how the code behaves. The only difference of performant code and non-performant code is the speed. The inputs and outputs should be the same. So when you're doing things like adding tests to make sure your performance work doesn't uh, hurt your uh, doesn't change behavior, uh, then your new tests uh, are working the same way as a refactoring. So I think of performance the same way. And the last one, maybe the most important one, uh, is developer happiness. Uh, developer happiness is where you can put a lot of those little things we talked about at the beginning. Uh, and again, you know it when you see it. Uh, and I know it's weird to say, but measuring consistency is hard. But I can say if I'm happier looking at a piece of code. So keep calm, focus on metrics, and we'll get started with actual reasons to refactor. And the number one that I like, curiously enough, is developer happiness. Uh, this is, <laughs> it's, a, it's a bad reason to do, to do those little things that bother you uh, for their own sake. Uh, but if you like working with your code every day, you'll do a better job on it. It just matters. Uh, and more importantly, you can say, I'm gonna spend two hours on this on Friday. Uh, because I'm going to like looking at it tomorrow. And that's measurable as, in a way that a lot of refactoring isn't. Number two, increased performance. It's a great uh, benefit of refactoring, so it's a great reason to do it. Reason three, and maybe the most important thing that you'll do with refactoring, this is what people talk about, is to gain confidence for future work or paying off technical debt. Gaining confidence for future work uh, is most of what we do when we refactor. When we sit down and say, I have a new thing to do, but I'm scared to do it because the code's in such a state that adding the new feature or fixing that bug, I'm not confident that if I do that, it will work out, or that it'll be safe, that the project works at all. 
at the end of a project, you can say, uh, I don't know if that abstraction is better. It's a, t a matter of taste, right? But you can say, I have confidence because of my new tests, because my tests are more expressible, that I can make a change that will be effective. You can measure the success of that refactoring by asking yourself if you're more confident after it about making that change you wanted. And the last good reason to refactor uh, is developer education. I think refactoring is a wonderful way to onboard new team members uh, or to dive into a project that you're not familiar with. Uh, it's very easy to look at ugly code. It's everywhere. Uh, and refactoring something will usually force you to run up against edges of the system uh, that were done badly for a reason. And maybe you can fix it, and maybe it was historic, and maybe you can't. Uh, but it's a great way to learn how it works. Uh, whenever I add somebody to a team, I almost always ask them to do something that doesn't change behavior first. Uh, I think it's a, a great way to get your feet wet, and it's much easier to measure the success of a simple refactoring uh, than it is to measure the success of a feature uh, where the tests are brand new and everything else. Moving on to part two, uh, there's some techniques to refactoring uh, that I like to add. The first technique is the little bits of happy that you add throughout your code. To go back to the very first slide I had, I've removed three layers of nesting here. This is much easier for me to read. I do this every chance I get. It makes me a little happier. It's measurable. To go back to this slide, it's a bad reason by itself, but it makes me happy. That's a good reason. Reducing two lines of code to one, make a function that, that solidifies something. Here, working with these addresses is annoying. Make an address object, make a list of them that's a little bit easier. Add a new good layer of abstraction. Here, quotation mark consistency. I'm kind of a nerd about quotation mark consistency. Uh, and here's another example, uh, a multi-line ternary, something that makes me actually cry, not just sad, uh, replaced with a early return and an implicit return. Uh, and another one I always like to look for is uh, if you can organize your code like a spreadsheet, like data, you should. There's a reason people make little tables. This is just a very simple hash map. Uh, all we're doing here is lining up the code so that I can read it better next time. Five little examples of little things that make me happier. And the sum answer of that, of course, is to get a style guide. Uh, it doesn't matter if your code base uh, has the right style guide. It matters that you have a style guide. Uh, it's important to not be discussing with your team members what kind of quotation marks you wish you would use when you could be talking about important stuff about how well does this code work? Does this new feature solve the customer's problem? Is this bug going to be solved? Is this code going to be slower? Make a decision even the wrong one, and then defend it religiously, like it's the most important thing that's ever happened, exactly because it's not. Uh, this is something I love about Go. Go ships with exactly two binaries, the compiler and the code formatter, and instantly ends an entire class of programming arguments. It's a beautiful thing. Good job, Go. Uh, the second technique I like to bring up uh, are types for verbs. This is a fairly simple example. Um, whenever I have <coughs> a method and I'm going to add an argument to it, in this case I have a bank account, I have a transfer method, <coughs> uh, I'm going to add a when argument, an at. I want to schedule this transaction to happen in the future. Whenever you have an existing verb and you're adding a new argument to it, consider if you've made that verb complicated enough to be a noun. In this case, it's pretty ugly. I've had to add to my account concept of how background jobs work inside my system. Uh, and it just feels awkward. The method has a, a big ugly if in it. It's basically two different things that could happen. But if we turn that transaction into a noun, 
uh, its own class, for example, uh, then we have created a uh, initializer and a run. So this initializer will schedule itself. Uh, the run will run the same code as before, uh, but when something else happens. And now an account, rather than have to understand how background jobs work, uh, can simply create a new transaction object and return what it would do if it were to transfer. Uh, turning nouns into, turning verbs into nouns, excuse me, uh, is very powerful. You'll find pretty quickly that you'll want lots of other methods on your new nouns. You'll want to ask, was this action successful? When did it complete? Why did it fail? Uh, it's much easier to save these very useful error messages and return them to users when you have turned uh, your very nice, tight, small method into a noun. Uh, the third thing uh, that you'll do when you refactor is add useful layers of abstraction. Uh, whenever you have code like this, this is from GitHub, uh, this is pull requests, asking if the branch on a pull request is valid, asking if it exists. Whenever you have a bunch of something followed by an underscore like that, uh, it's begging for an object to replace it. Instead of asking the pull request, is your branch valid? You can ask the pull requests branch, are you valid? The same works on the other side of the underscore. Uh, in this case, we have a couple of pull requests saying, are you mergeable for a couple of different reasons? There's actually five or six different reasons for a pull request on GitHub that we might not be able to merge it. CI might not be passing. Uh, the Git has an actual conflict. The base repository has been deleted and a bunch of other weird conditions. The Git file server could be offline. Um, when I looked at this and saw a bunch of methods underscore mergeable, uh, I noticed that we were having a lot of problems that looked something like this. We were simply asking the pull request system, is Git mergeable? Uh, and if it was, we would show the merge button. And if it wasn't, we would show a disabled merge button. Uh, this is an incredibly easy mistake for a programmer to make because on a pull request here, we have a number of different ways uh, that a thing might not be mergeable. So this is a bug that looks like perfectly good code. I wanted to replace this with a method that actually worked, something like, is the pull request stable and ready to merge? And in order to do that, I pulled out a new object that represented the underscore mergeable on all of those previous methods. That object can ask, is the git status okay? Is continuous integration okay? Is the file server online? So we replaced several methods like this with a class something like this. The merge state takes a pull request as an argument and knows enough about how to use that pull request to answer the question of is that pull request ready to be merged? So we added a great abstraction there, merge state, uh, but you also need to remove layers of abstraction when you're not using them. Uh, this is a huge source of code bloat uh, and will definitely help in uh, your ability to express tests uh, when you don't need to set up uh, layers of code that you're not actually using. Uh, abstractions fall out of use all the time. Uh, I have an example here, which is from the adapter pattern. Uh, we use this all over in programming. If you're going to post chat messages, it's very common to have an adapter that can post to a number of different chat services, to Campfire, to Slack, to HipChat, to whatever. Uh, we do this also for file storage. There's lots of libraries that will abstract local file system versus S3 versus Rackspace Cloud versus 15 other different services. Um, if you're not using the adapter between the services, this is something uh, that I find can often improve performance. Adapters don't often uh, map one-to-one -to, -one to the service you're using. Uh, so for example, this is a chat adapter. Uh, the application that it was in was only using Campfire. Uh, so there was another adapter, a whole other layer of code that replicated every method we can do in Campfire. Uh, it meant that chatting was a little more complicated. 
than it needed to be. Uh, we always had to create a new adapter. We were specifying campfire everywhere that we were using chat, even though it was always going to be campfire. We replaced it with uh, a module not much more complicated than this, uh, literally one line of code and one method to post chat to a room name. And the use of it became something like this. Uh, when I say adapters can reduce performance, there's two ways they can do it. Uh, the first is, in a language like Ruby, it can literally just be slower uh, if it's a very critical path. Uh, and the other way is that uh, if you're using a chat uh, adapter, for example, and you're posting by room name, uh, well, Campfire only lets you post by ID. That adapter, very helpfully, will wrap up the lookup of the ID from the room name for you. Uh, but you're making a second API call every time that happens. Uh, you'll have better control over what you're doing and what your code is doing uh, if you simply wrap that up and move along. Uh, in this case, pulling out an adapter layer from chat from the project was a huge win in terms of code uh, and let me remove uh, a lot of application code and a lot of uh, really annoying test setup stuff too, which made my tests more uh, expressive. Even if you use good techniques, there are problems and pitfalls that you'll run into when you're refactoring. Uh, the first one is the big one, the one we all know about. Uh, it's existing bugs. Uh, when you're refactoring something into a, a new layer of abstraction, uh, it's very often that you'll find some chunk of behavior that wasn't defined before. Uh, there wasn't a test for it. Uh, it was something that happened only when some weird condition occurred and now you have to handle it explicitly, but before, you know, you didn't have to write it down and something happened, but who knows? Uh, one of the most important things you can do in refactoring is to not fix bugs while you're doing it. That sounds unintuitive, uh, but if you mix changing behavior with refactoring and then ship that out, it's very, very difficult to determine if it was your refactoring or your fix that actually broke something. It took me a long time to learn, but I'm very glad I did, to, to gain the discipline uh, to make a new branch every time I'm refactoring, and if I find an actual bug, to stop refactoring, fix the bug, define the bug, and move on. Sometimes you can't get around it, and you have to put a terrible, ugly corner case in your new shiny refactoring, but I prefer that. Uh, a terrible, ugly corner case with a code comment is usually a much more short-lived issue uh, than a, uh, something that just isn't defined, a corner case of behavior that happened because nobody thought to check for it. Another risk of refactoring are performance changes. Again, to speak of Ruby, uh, adding a single abstraction layer can be disastrous in a critical path. Uh, but you have to measure this. It's easy for the test to say that things are fine uh, and for them not really to be fine at all. And the third is context. This one's complicated. I'm gonna try and go through it slowly. Uh, context is where it's very difficult to determine what you need to do to change a method uh, because where it comes from is, is isolated to one place. Uh, I think an example is best to show here. This is our git RPC client, it makes a little block, we want to fetch a file. It's a fairly standard operation we do at GitHub. Imagine we want to add a length argument to it. We want to say how many bytes of that file do you want to load? We have a number of performance reasons why we want to do this, for example. Well, this client is actually using a method on an object called a tree entry, which represents a git file, and it has a data method. So we're going to need to change this data method too. The problem is that this is pretty much the only place this data method is called, and it's under six layers of a call stack. And it's very difficult to unwind that and determine how something is used. Uh, and the thing is, you can't do a quick, simple search and replace. Tree, tree that, that data method where we need to add a length argument, well, sometimes a length argument is, isn't correct. So for head bytes, if we want to look at the front of a file, we would want to limit it. We don't need to load the whole file. But if we need to look at the back end of the file, we actually do need to pull the whole thing out. So this is 
the correct thing would be to have two methods, for example. But if you were to look at the tree entry data, because it's stacked down the context of that six layer call stack every time it's used, that's not clear. And you simply have to go through the code base everywhere that it's doing something and determine if the change you're making works. The sum effect of this, unfortunately, is that really big refactorings are a really big risk. Uh, so what we have to do is break them down just like we would any larger problem. The number one tool programmers have for breaking down a refactoring and the most important thing you should be thinking about when you're trying to handle more complicated refactorings is deprecation. Uh, you have done deprecation if you have ever made a method uh, underscore new or underscore old or underscore two or anything else where you made a new method but couldn't remove the old one, you deprecated something. In this case, to go back to the previous example with the context, uh, we would want to deprecate uh, a fetch, for example. Uh, most large applications will end up with some sort of real deprecation facility. At GitHub, for example, we have this. You can do this pretty much anywhere in the entire GitHub code base. Uh, the method still exists. Uh, you declare that something is deprecated. You say what you should migrate the new method to. Uh, in GitHub code base, this will fail in the tests, but work in production. So you can be moving forward on a branch to try and refactor and find all the cases where something has been called. But even deprecation, as powerful as it is, it's truly the number one refactoring tool that we have, uh, doesn't always work. To go back to the head bytes and tail bytes example, uh, we can deprecate fetch usually, but it's not actually deprecated for the tail bytes. Uh, so deprecation needs to be contextual. If it were to be more powerful, it needs to happen at runtime, and most systems don't do that. We'll get to that in a little bit. Uh, the most important thing you can do other than deprecation is to use backwards compatible API designs. Uh, and what that means is to work backwards from what you expect the system to look like and to make the existing behavior a special case of that. Uh, an example of that, this is a, a table I changed uh, recently. Uh, it had a bunch of items in it. Only one item could be current. Everyone had an ID and a current. The change was that there could be more than one current thing. That's a big deal. It was a big change. Everywhere that was looking for one item now had to look for a list. And a lot of the code touched this. So we were pretty nervous about making this change in one go. We wanted to break it down. So we decided that we would write some backwards compatible uses of that API. Uh, the first thing we did was to change the loading up of whatever was current. Uh, to stop expecting just one thing to be current uh, and instead to get everything that was current and forget about everything but the last one. This kept the behavior working the same but allowed us to change the data model to be something that the new system could expect. We went to the UI and we changed it from having the current widget to having a list of current widgets which always happened to be of size one because we had pruned it earlier. Later when we unpruned it, that list would just work and we could have some test data sets where that unpruned all by itself. I like to think of this as the code version of the product trick of letting users disable a new version of a product. Google does this a lot when they do product redesigns. Uh, for a while, when you use a Google product, you can switch back to the old design. Uh, this makes people happier with Google because people you know, get angry about changes all the time. And uh, this solves a lot of problems for Google. It's basically the same thing for code. Uh, the old version will still work. The code can keep using it if it so chooses. It would be better, the code suggests, if you used the new way. The problem with backwards compatible API design is that it violates our diff stat rule. It's really unfortunate that way because this is one of the most important measures we have. Uh, this is one of the pull requests related to that current database table. Uh, that's 73 new lines that can have a problem, 73 new lines that need tests. Uh, 
you're explicitly not removing the old behavior. So by definition, the code is going to grow. Which brings us back to the point that big refactorings are a risk and we mitigate risks by writing tools. Uh, this is actually what we do for most of software. Uh, I want to talk about two tools GitHub has written uh, that help us with some large scale refactorings. Uh, we wrote both of these uh, in order to support a large scale refactoring of our permission system. As the site grew, uh, the way the database tables were set up to determine who had permission to access a repository, to administrate a repository, whatever, was all very slow, very unfortunate, we could say. Uh, this is a big deal. GitHub sells privacy, so we can't get it wrong. Uh, it took us almost two years to refactor that because we went slowly and carefully. And about the first three or four months of it, we're writing powerful tools that we used from then forward. The first one is called Backscatter. Backscatter is aimed squarely at solving the context problem. Uh, the context problem, recall, is when things happen way down the stack and you need to know how a thing is being called, why it's being used. Um, Backscatter dumps a bunch of results into a web page from code calls like this. This is the tree entry data that we looked at earlier. Backscatter trace uh, 72 means that 72% of calls the developer refactoring this was halfway through the process of ramping this up when I pulled this screenshot. 72% uh, of backscatter calls uh, will, uh, of data calls, excuse me, will be backscattered. And backscatter collects data like this. It collects data that says where something was called from, how often it was called. It creates a little link so you can get straight to the text. It's very convenient. Uh, there are other arguments to backscatter, more importantly, uh, that let you worry about the call stack a couple of layers up. So if something is almost always called from one place, but what you really want to know is who's calling the thing that's calling it, backscatter can make a list similar to this, uh, but at a higher level. Uh, unfortunately, it can't figure out where the backscatter trace separates, uh, but right now we can figure that out. We also use backscatter for our deprecation. Uh, when deprecated code paths are hit in production, and they drop a little thing in our developer toolkit, uh, which says that this per particular uh, backscatter thing happened. What I love about backscatter here is that it will do it in runtime. So backscatter deprecate method if direct org membership enabled, right? That's a performance feature flag for people we're testing with a new performance, whatever. Uh, that method is not deprecated unless the user has been assigned to the refactored user set, right? We didn't roll out the refactoring to every user all at once. It would be too dangerous. So we enabled it slowly with a feature flag. Every user had a flag in the database about whether or not the refactored code path was enabled for them. Being able to deprecate at runtime is really powerful uh, because it means that we can find places where the code absolutely has to be done, wiped out, uh, if there's no if statement. But that if statement means that this is not really deprecated, it's only deprecated for the people working on that org membership uh, performance feature flag. Backscatter gives us nice counts, the time of day and everything else about how often a thing happens. Uh, this is the, uh, you can copy paste that little backscatter trace 1412 into a method to try and add something to this graph. The other tool we use, and I love backscatter, but I like this one better for two reasons. One, it's just really cool. Uh, and the other is that backscatter, we haven't been able to open source, uh, is science. Science is a Ruby library for refactoring critical code paths. Uh, it's similar to A-B testing, but not. Imagine you have a method, get widgets, and you have to make some widgets out of it. Uh, and this is an important method in your code base. It's called a lot, it's really important. So you make a get widgets new. You deprecate get widgets because 
you made an underscore new. The new way of getting widgets loads them from a database. It's a whole new different way of doing things. Uh, it's dramatically different. How would we know if it worked or not? How could we flip the switch to see if this works? Widgets used to come, say, from a text file. Now they come from a database. Uh, it's a dramatic change, and it's not safe to make. What science does is lets us run an experiment. In this case, we created an experiment called widgets.loading, and we told the experiment to use the old git widgets method, but also alongside it to try the new git widgets method. Those two methods will both be run, and you can configure percentages and stuff like that. Uh, but the important part is that the two methods will both be run. What comes from e.use, the control candidate, will always happen. That's what the user will see. If an error is raised, an error will be raised. Uh, if something breaks, something will break. But it's these old results. You haven't changed behavior. E.try is a new method. E.try lets us try that new method out in a way uh, that is completely safe. If it raises an exception, it'll be ignored. If the data is different, and this is where it's amazing, uh, it'll be sent somewhere that you can configure. Uh, and it will have the returned old data and the returned new data and a huge pile of context as well. You can configure how much information you want here. Uh, this means that we can do things like narrow down users who have permission sets that aren't covered by the new permission system because we can see that the old permission system said that they have access to these 10 repositories and the new one said these 11. Well, why would that be? What case hadn't we covered that handled that 11th repository? We used this really heavily for a year and a half to roll out a really complicated refactoring uh, on a large application with, uh, as far as we know, no errors. By the time we were done, the biggest problem were existing uncovered cases. Uh, forks of forks of forks of forks of forks, where somewhere in the middle of the fork chain somebody's made it private. It gets weird. Uh, it was an amazing experience. The library that came out of that we use now pretty much all the time. Uh, we get a beautiful little set of results. Uh, for example, that top one there is contrib calendar days with today was something about changing the GitHub contribution graph on your homepage to use different time zones or something. I wasn't actually involved, but we can see that it, the experiment is running 100% of the time and it hasn't been wrong in the last 24 hours. Uh, you can see languages.4 user uh, is wrong less than 1% of the time, uh, but the red means it's a lot slower in this case. And that's another thing that we use science for a whole, whole lot is performance testing. Accuracy graphs are interesting, but it doesn't take long until the error is at zero. Performance graphs are much more interesting. We can break down the performance of two different methods between the candidate, the old method that is working and we trust the results, and, uh, excuse me, the control, and the candidate method, uh, which is new, and we don't trust the results yet, and we wanna see how it performs. In this case, we can see the green graph on the bottom tells us that the new method is much faster in the average case. The wiggly blue line mixed with the other green line tell us that in the 99% percentile case, it's still bad. So this particular experiment uh, probably hasn't uh, saved us a whole lot of work down the line. Uh, this pattern is really powerful, and we use it across a lot of different projects whenever we're doing a large refactoring now. Uh, unfortunately, it did take a while to set up all this stuff that comes into the application, the graphs and uh, the comparison functions and the timing things and percentage corrects that get displayed right in the website. Uh, but it's not as hard as you might think. Uh, last thing about science is that it will, uh, uh, you can set it to run something for 100 100% uh, of all calls, but not record data for large data sets. So if you're looking for all the files in a repository, for example, that could be a very large data set. We don't wanna record that data set every time. We can say only record instances where it was too slow. Uh, 
And this is the one we've exposed, but you can actually do things where say only record instances where the difference was greater than some configurable threshold or anything else we worry about. That one is a published Ruby gem. Uh, you should download it and use it. It's pretty great. Uh, and that's, in a way, the end of the talk, because uh, part three is basically just me complaining uh, after having refactoring uh, for a little while. Uh, the tools for refactoring on the whole are pretty poor. Backscatter is great. It took an incredible amount of work to do, and not every programming language would let you do it. Uh, science is pretty great, uh, but it's only available in Ruby right now. And the visualization is half the fun, and it doesn't come out of the box. Most refactoring tools are limited to editor level stuff. Things like really good search replace, uh, which from the context problem is basically worthless. Uh, Visual Studio has some interesting stuff like extract resource, where it will take a field and always make that an object or into a function. So you can turn, you know, I don't know, it's not very useful. None of the editor level refactoring tools are, I find, terribly useful. Um, there's a couple of language facilities. Java, good job Java, uh, actually has a deprecation facility right there in the language uh, with that little at deprecated. Uh, this is not perfect, of course, uh, but it's right there in the language. Every other framework out there of any size ends up having to add a deprecation facility. Rails has some active support to deprecation. Django has one. Uh, any framework you're using has a deprecate method. Java has one in the language, so nobody has to rewrite it, and everybody knows what they're looking for uh, across frameworks and across packages. It's an improvement. C also has a deprecation pragma. C++ 14 added a deprecation pragma, which is great. Um, the problem with Java and C's deprecation facilities, uh, as we just talked about with Backscatter, is that compile time deprecation sucks. It's not smart enough to know if something is deprecated in every context. You need to know, am I doing something that means this is deprecated? Am I using new code so I should never have ended up in this method? Unfortunately, you can't do that uh, with the normal stuff. Uh, and this is uh, my Perl slide. It's, it's yet another Perl conference. This is actually something I love. These are the, uh, the junctions in Perl 6. Um, quickly, x can be 1 or 2. x equals 1, x equals 2. If you multiply x by 3, x is now equal to uh, 3 and 6. Um, it's something that lets a variable be more than one thing in certain contexts. It's more complicated than this, of course. Uh, but I would love to see uh, a language that gave me the ability to do this with a function, for example, to return more than one result uh, based on some exterior context uh, so that uh, I can do something with it. To have a concept of a refactoring that's not done instead of assuming the program is complete. Uh, I'd love to see something that had a deprecation facility where I could suggest an alternative and it would run it and tell me if the result was different and if it was slower. Why is that just a text message telling me to go do a thing? It sounds something great, like a computer would be great at that. Unfortunately, I don't have a great example of that, which is why this is the complaining part. Uh, I'm still looking around for refactoring tools. Uh, but the truth is, there's plenty of tools out there. You can get it done. I'm all done. That's the talk. Thanks. Uh, hi, thank you for your talk. Uh, if there is a control about debatable point in some of the factory, how do you manage it at GitHub? Uh, can you repeat the question? I'm sorry. Uh, can you repeat the question? I'm sorry. Uh, yes. If there is a control about debatable point in some of the factory. How do you manage it at GitHub? I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm not sure I understand control buffer. Uh, 
Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, so the, the question is, uh, when there's disagreements about how to approach a refactoring, uh, how do you resolve those discussions? Uh, the number one way that we resolve them is the same way we resolve any work we do. We talk about it on a pull request. Uh, related to that, I think, is why it's so important to have a style guide. There are legitimate answers and discussions to be had. Reasonable people can disagree about how to do backwards compatible API design. It's very difficult for uh, two people to have that real conversation when they're arguing about semicolons and quotation marks. Uh, a style guide removes a lot of points of discussion within a code base. Um, I would say that by and large, we also look to our uh, refactoring metrics. Uh, if I look at the code and I don't love it, but I go to the tests and the tests are much better, uh, we can usually reference each other to that chunk of code and say, yes, I don't love this either, but see where it improved this. And we just talk about it. Communication is key. So the question is, uh, based on what criteria should you uh, decide when you should refactor and when you should spend time on new features? Uh, the most important factor I use uh, is confidence about changes. Uh, and that's why one of the number one reasons to refactor on there was to gain confidence before making changes. I know I need to refactor when I have a feature that needs doing, but I'm not confident that I can add it or change it or fix it without breaking something else. And that confidence, unfortunately, is hard to measure directly. Uh, most of my good refactorings come in response to a feature before it. Uh, it's difficult to refactor on its own in the air. You're not sure what you're going for. You're often trying to lay the groundwork for something else, but you don't know where on the ground you need to do that work until you've seen the, the feature coming down the pipeline. Does that make sense? Thank you, Dave. Um, you said not to uh, fix bugs while refactoring, and uh, that you would create a new ground to fix the bugs on. But sometimes when it's a bigger bug or something, what I do is um, write a test that exposes the bug and keep refactoring and then just do it afterwards. Or do you think that's not such a good idea for some reason? Uh, it depends on the size. Did that get recorded by video? Any question? Okay. The question is, uh, I guess I got asked to repeat questions for video. So the question is, uh, uh, when do you decide when a bug is too big to be fixed during a refactoring? Uh, and unfortunately, it's a gut feeling. I try to keep it pretty small uh, because when something goes wrong, I really want to know, was it the refactoring or was it the fix? Uh, that's the most important thing for me. But there are times where the refactoring is so important to fixing the bug that you just have to power through it. Uh, there are times when you, you're building a framework that would let you test the, the new bug effectively, and backporting the tests without the refactoring doesn't work. It happens. It's a judgment call, but I try to err on the side of doing them separately. Thank you. 
It's a good question. Uh, so the question is, our goal in refactoring is to not change behavior. How do we know what those behaviors are? Uh, and the number one way for that is simply tests. Uh, if you don't feel confident uh, across the set of behaviors that your application has, uh, that if you make a change, the tests won't break or otherwise go awkward, uh, then the first thing I would do is add tests. Uh, and you might remember there were two different slides for uh, test coverage and test expressibility. Often when I'm starting a new refactoring on a project that is not well-defined, I won't change a thing. I will only add tests no matter how bad or complicated those tests are because I want to make sure uh, that I have something to start from. Test expressibility is something that you can improve when you change the code. Uh, but test coverage is always something you can improve uh, without doing anything. It might be a little bit with a crowbar and a sledgehammer to try and uh, work through some bad code bases, but you can always find a way to get more tests in. So the question is, uh, do I use the design pattern when refactoring? Um, and if there is a pattern that's not that, do I use it? Uh, I would say no, uh, on the whole. I, I actually have a lot of respect for uh, design-driven development, uh, which I think is closely related to, to that pattern. Um, but I don't love it because I think it tends to make the code fit the tests as opposed to uh, let good tests be a result of good code. Um, I do like the design pattern uh, because it's a disciplined and rigorous way of looking at how to do a refactoring and how to measure the effectiveness of a layer of abstraction. Um, it's not one I use, but I don't think I would tell somebody it's bad. The question is, uh, if you have to make a change to the style guide, how do you go about that? And if you have to make a change during a change, how do you impact that? Uh, our style guide is just a set of pages on the website, and we talk about it in pull requests, the same way we talk about it in code. Uh, right after I started at GitHub, uh, the, the main GitHub style guide said, always use double quotes in Ruby. Uh, you can sometimes use single, and you can sometimes use double, but unless something makes you use single quotes, always use double quotes. And there was a big discussion about it because it was a change. Um, I liked having that discussion there in the style guide as opposed to in a pull request where I was doing code. Uh, so that isolates that sort of discussion. So the first thing there is to just make your style guide something that is in a, a repository that you can discuss. The second is that if you're doing something, you need to make a style, change, style guide change during it. 
I would say that's a lot like uh, fixing a bug during a refactoring. And I would go change the style guide or not during in a separate activity and then come back and solve the refactoring when I was done. When you say recommendation, uh, do you mean uh, like encouraging? Uh, I would say not an official one, uh, but refactorings get a lot of happy emojis and GIFs. Uh, we are pretty effusive with praise about good work, and refactoring is no exception. Uh, it's something where uh, it takes a little bit of discipline to get as excited about cleanups as it does about uh, an actual feature ship or something exciting. Uh, but when you have a, a team of developers who think like you do, uh, a lot of emoji go a long way. Thank you. So the question is, um, how do you proceed with refactoring uh, when you've uh, inherited uh, legacy code, which is, I think, correctly defined as code that has no tests, no documentation, uh, where the correct behavior of the code is not well defined? Uh, the deployment system I talked about earlier, when I inherited it, did not have a single test. Um, and what I started with was very high level, web request level tests uh, measuring JSON output uh, eventually, I was able to start to write tests for the underlying components of the system once I understood what those tests were. Uh, those top-level tests for a legacy system are really uncomfortable. Uh, there's no good way to put it. Uh, there's no easy way to make them clean or nice. Uh, you have to make tests at such a high level that setting up the test is complicated and annoying. You're going to be the first person to write uh, fake network calls it's going to be very arduous. But the first step is always to write tests. Uh, question is, uh, so you would separate the process of refactoring uh, from writing those tests? And I would say yes. I wouldn't change application code before I had some sort of test over that code. Uh, especially with legacy systems, it's unlikely you'll reach anything like full coverage. Uh, but it's important to have just a couple so that you have a test framework set up for when you do start to make changes. You will soon enough make a change to that legacy system, right? It's important you've added enough coverage that you know where to add a test at all, that you know how to run the test system, that you have some sort of baseline for improving it in the future. Uh, and that means the first thing before a single change is probably a pull request that does nothing but add even just six or eight tests. Thank you. 
Thanks for the talk. Uh, let me ask uh, somewhat related also this question. Uh, when doing uh, factoring uh, with this, uh, do you also try to refactor the actual tests themselves alongside the same refactoring or in a different uh, session of refactoring? That's actually a good question. Um, test refactoring is absolutely a thing that needs to be done, just like regular code. I'll usually mix that with another refactoring. Uh, what I won't necessarily uh, mix up so much is uh, new tests and changing tests. I, I like when I change tests to be, that can be part of a separate refactoring, and often you'll need to change the test slightly to match the refactoring, especially if you have network calls that are changing or it, it gets complicated. But I would call test refactoring code refactoring and I'll mix them together a bit. Thank you.